our movies, American movies, in my opinion, are a reflection of American society, good and bad. We hold up a mirror to ourselves, unlike anybody else in the world. And we admit that we're not perfect through our films, but we're telling stories about who we are as a nation. Prominent CEOs, leading economists, iconic investors, insights from the experts. The Walker Webcast with Willie Walker. See who's next. Charlie, it's wonderful to have you here. Um, I'm going to jump into a quick bio on you before I get to our discussion. Uh, Charles H. Rifkin is chairman and CEO of the Motion Picture Association. He leads the MPA's global mission to advance and support the film, television, and streaming content industry. Drawing on almost 30 years of experience as a media executive and a leading U.S. diplomat, Rifkin advocates for policies that drive investments in film and television production, protect creative content, and open markets. As Chief Executive Riskin is also responsible for the MPA's iconic movie rating system, which has served parents and moviegoers for over 50 years. Prior to joining the MPA, Ambassador Rivkin was the U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for Economic and Business Affairs, and prior to that, he was the United States Ambassador to France and Monaco. During his posting, Rivkin was personally awarded the Légion d'Honneur with the rank of Commander by the President of France, he also received the city of Paris, Paris's highest honor, and I hope I get this pronounced correctly. Uh, Ambassador Rivkin would do it perfectly with his French, La Grande Medaille de Vermille de la Ville de Paris, and was presented with the U.S. Navy's Distinguished Public Service Award. Before his government service, Rivkin worked in the media and entertainment sector for more than 20 years. During that period, he served as president and CEO of the Jim Henson Company, home to the Muppets and other award-winning film and television franchises and beloved characters. Ambassador Rivkin received his bachelor's degree from Yale University and an MBA from Harvard. So Charlie, first of all, thank you again for joining me. Um, your career is expansive, wildly successful, and crosses three distinct, I would say industries, but sort of professions is I think better, because when I think about industries, I think about you went from the media industry over to the natural gas industry or something of that nature. But to have been in business and then foreign policy and politics and then on to advocacy um, in your current role, I want to come back to how you've led successfully across those distinct industry or professional groups. But you had a wonderful role model in leadership from your dad, who is U.S. Ambassador to Luxembourg. What was it like growing up as the son of an ambassador? Well, Willie, first of all, it's great seeing you. Um, I do apologize for my background here, but I'm in Sun Valley, as you pointed out. Uh, it's an honor to be part of the Walker webcast, and I, I really appreciate you, uh, you including me. You, you mentioned my dad. My father was John Kennedy's ambassador to Luxembourg, and then he was Lyndon Johnson's ambassador uh, to uh, Senegal. And sadly, he, he died while serving as ambassador in, in, in Dakar when I was only about five years old. So I didn't um, know him as well as I'd like, but I was inspired by him. I wanted maybe one day to be an ambassador the way a kid that loves baseball would love to play for the Yankees. It was never going to happen. But um, I wish he could have seen me in that role, but something tells me he was uh, he was with me. But I wanted to point out that when he died, uh, Hubert Humphrey was the vice president. He was my godfather. And so he helped us create an award at the State Department called the William Rivkin Award, honors intellectual courage and constructive dissent, meaning that the only award named in the U.S. government for people who respectfully disagree with the U.S. government bears my family's name. And it's been going on since 1968, so I'm very proud of that. So, Charlie, for a moment there, uh, Godfather Hubert Humphrey, Vice President of the United States, uh, a father who was an ambassador. I mean, you were all around politics growing up. Um, did that say, I got to get to that someday in my life? Or was there actually a, a sort of a, the reverse of that, of sort of saying that may have been what my dad did, but I'm going to chart a new path? I have a picture on the wall of my office in Washington of um, me at around uh, seven years old or so at the 1968 Democratic National Convention in Chicago with my godfather, Humphrey. Uh, and uh, it's been on my wall because um, uh, he was an inspirational figure. And from my standpoint, um, although I wish I had known my dad better, as I mentioned, um, I think public service is the highest calling. And I was a little bit uh, afraid of jumping in and becoming a full-time foreign, uh, you know, foreign service officer when I was younger. But I had the chance now to serve at state for eight years. And it was very fulfilling. 
So you mentioned growing up, maybe thinking about being a baseball player, but you're actually a singer and you were a member of the Whiffin Poofs when you were at Yale. Do you ever think about actually trying to become a professional singer or was it more of a hobby? <laughs> well, I guess I'm aware of my own limitations, uh, but, you know, being at the Whiffin Poofs, which is the oldest a cappella singing group in the country, uh, I was 22 years old and I had a chance to travel to all around the world from Beijing to Cairo to, to Bangkok, um, Tokyo, uh, and really see things that I never thought I'd see. So it was an incredible experience. Um, and it was for me, it wasn't so much that I wanted to be a professional singer because I don't have those chops, but I love being surrounded by creative people. And that's one of the reasons that I pursued a career in the entertainment industry, because I'm inspired by creativity and creative people, even though I wouldn't hire myself to write that incredible script or produce that amazing film. So you went to HBS. Why HBS versus the Kennedy School, given the longstanding sort of connectivity to politics and, and, and potentially going into it at some point in your career? I um I was inspired by uh, I, you know one of the reasons I went to HBS and, and I know you did as well is of its proximity to the Kennedy School so I actually intended when I went there to take courses at Kennedy and to really um, take advantage of all the uh, resources that Harvard University had to offer sadly I didn't do that um, I uh, not really just focused on the MBA but why an MBA my grandfather ran a um, uh, a children's clothing company and. He always I was fascinated by his career because when you give somebody employment, when you give them a job, you change their lives. And in many ways, you change the community, you change society. And I love the idea of being a CEO of my own business and helping to grow and, and, and be part of uh, the local community, but also make a difference on the international stage. I didn't know what kind of business I wanted to go in at the time, but uh, but I knew I wanted to be in business. You've said before, Charlie, that, that economic development is such an important component part, if you will, of foreign policy. Um, and your comment there as it relates to getting an MBA versus going to the Kennedy School. I mean, in your current role at the Motion Picture Association, one of the great parts about it and your background is just the amount of exporting that the Motion Picture Association does as it relates to selling films abroad. Um, talk for just a moment about how that focus on economic development played into your overall career, both in the public world as well as in the private sector. Well, um, uh, you know, economics are, are one thing in my business, but we also are an enormous source of soft power and cultural exchange. I know Jim Henson believed that media, if used properly, could be an enormous source for good in the world. And I was attracted to his company, uh, the Jim Henson Company, where I first started working out of business school, because he had almost a double bottom line. He wanted to make the world a better place, and he also wanted to make money for his shareholders and grow his business. Uh, in the entertainment business at large, what I represent now, the Motion Picture Association is 100 years old this year, and we represent the six largest entertainment companies in the world. And um, what, what our industry is pretty extraordinary because we are one of America's greatest exporters, both of our cultural diplomacy and cultural assets, as well as our economics. We export about four times what we import at the MPA, uh, excuse me, in, in the entertainment industry. And we sell to about 131 countries around the world. We have a positive trade surplus with every nation on earth where, where we do business. Because what we make here in America, uh, the industry was largely created in America. The French may disagree with that, but I would argue that it was created in America. Uh, and um, uh, it, it's something we do better than anybody else, in my humble opinion. You mentioned that you were at the Jim Henson Company. Um, you rose to be CEO of the Jim Henson Company and then actually successfully sold the company. There are not too many CEOs who work to sort of sell themselves out of a job. What was it that you and Jim saw at that time as it relates to the opportunity to sell that company at that time? I think you sold it to Fox. We sold it. Well, it's interesting. We, we, um, Jim was um, an amazing human being, Jim, Jim Henson. And he uh, was one of the most creative people I've ever met in my life. He was one of a kind. And uh, he wanted to do things creative. He didn't want to run a business. He wanted to just play in, in, you know, in a creative world. And so he was intrigued by Michael Eisner at the time at Disney. Michael said, let me take the assets you built, the Muppets, Sesame Street's Muppets, all, all the Muppet characters and Fraggle Rock. And I don't know how many people in your audience know the Henson properties, but um, why don't, let me take those and preserve them forever. Let me make sure that they live on well past you. Unfortunately, uh, uh, Jim didn't know at the time that he was going to die at 53 years old, but he felt... Um, uh, you know, two years earlier, that uh, this was the right thing to do. And then Michael said, Eisner said to him, um, he took him to his theme park and he goes, Jim, if you dream it, we will make it. 
if anything you want to do, we will make it happen. You can be, we need, you know, a new Walt Disney at the company. That was the pitch they made to him. And he was intrigued by it. Uh, so he was able to monetize his assets, preserve them, and then live in a purely creative world afterwards. He never got there because he died tragically. And it was uh, very, very sad for, uh, for people in our company, of course, but I think for people around the world, he was an amazing person. So you were named U.S. Ambassador to France by President Obama. I guess two things, Charlie, which I've never asked you, which I probably should have previously. When did you first meet Obama and what was it about President Obama that was so compelling? So I, I had been, I started to get involved in, in politics back in 2003 because I met uh, John Kerry's chief of staff while doing a biking trip in, in, in Wyoming. And he goes, we could sure use your help in the 04 election because California, it's not, he's not doing real well. So I jumped in and became the head of Kerry's Southern California uh, team and uh, in Southern California, he ended up getting the nomination, didn't win the uh, presidency, of course. But when Obama was running back in 06, 07, he started calling all the people in the Democratic Party who, who had uh, helped uh, the last uh, candidate. And, and uh, so I got calls from almost everybody I have them on tape, actually, just for historical record calls from Hillary Clinton and, uh, and you know, you name it. Um, but I only returned one call to Obama. And I said, why you, Mr. Senator, and why now? What, you know, you're a young man. You have the future ahead of you. Why do you, why do you want to run for president right now? And he said, he said, Charlie, because when I am president of the United States, said a guy named Barack Hussein Obama, whose name was not familiar to most Americans and and uh, it sounded very strange and foreign to them at the time. He goes, when I am president of the United States, the world's gonna look at us differently. And we're gonna look at ourselves a little bit differently as well. And I thought about it and thought, you know, wouldn't it be nice, even if he doesn't win to support somebody who is as decent and smart and in my mind and, and you know, and incredibly charismatic as he is. So I, I said, I'm on board. And he put me um, uh, with a woman named Nicole Avon who was married to Ted Sarandos, who runs Netflix. And Nicole and I were the Southern California co-chairs of his campaign. So I got a chance to get to know him because I would travel state with him in, in small planes and I would introduce him at rallies. And uh, you know, before the bubble, when you're, as you know, Willie, when, when people run for president, eventually the bubble sets in because you just, there's too much security. There's too many people that want a piece of them. And back when he was a candidate that didn't think he was gonna win, I had the chance to get to know him. Did I? Think I'd be named ambassador? Of course not. I did it for other reasons. Did I even dare to dream I'd be named ambassador to France? No, that, that was beyond my wildest dreams. So when you were U.S. ambassador to France, you had movie nights on a pretty consistent basis, is my understanding, Charlie. And sure. you used film as a, if you will, a, a, a convener, the ability to pull um, French and Americans in France together to sort of discuss issues and kind of dive a little bit beyond the surface. How, A, how did you come up with that? But B, when I, when I listened to that and also given your current role, I thought it was fantastic that you, that you use film as sort of this great convenient, the convening power of film and put people around a table to discuss what you saw in the film and, and to some degree, a reflection of American society. Well, Willie, I'm impressed by your research. We did do that. We actually, my wife and I installed a screening room in the residence, the American Ambassador's residence, and we used film as a way of bringing society closer. A couple of stories about that, if you don't mind. I don't know what the time Please. is like. But um, one, you're right. We did, we did movie night. And our movies, American movies, in my opinion, are a reflection of American society, good and bad. We hold up a mirror to ourselves, unlike anybody else in the world. And we admit that we're not perfect through our films, but we're telling stories about who we are as a nation. And so I remember doing a film about the uh, financial crisis. I don't know if it was uh, too big to fail or, or um, uh, a margin call or I forgot, one of these films. And the French, um, it, because of their windowing, don't see movies until about six months after um, you know, they're released. And, and so American releases back at the time. Uh, so people, the highest level of the French government were watching movies that, they, that none of their friends had seen. And so they were gonna talk about it in society. And I remember I did this one screening and the a, a top minister was in the room. And after he watched the film, he says, you see, Mr. Ambassador, you see, you have destroyed the world. The Americans have destroyed the world with your greed and your arrogance. You've destroyed the world. I said, Mr. Mr. Minister, we're not afraid to admit our role uh, one way or the other, or at least to shine a bright spotlight on it so we can see whether um, these things will be repeated. But let me ask you a question, sir. When was the last time that you did a 
a movie in France about the French Algerian War. Now, it's still a very you know sensitive topic for the French, and they've never done that. We did wars about Vietnam uh, when it was you know still an open wound in our in our nation. We we do these things, and other nations, even France, there's a history in film, don't. But two other quick stories. I'm about to go to France, and I know I have to present my credentials to President Sarkozy. And uh, Sarkozy had a, a reputation for um, gathering all the ambassadors that needed to give him his credentials, ripping them out of their hands, and saying, "Okay, now you're ambassador." Whereas Obama would, you know, invite each ambassador and his family into the Oval Office individually. But that was Sarkozy's thing. So before I went there, Willie, I I got a friend of mine at uh, my, my cousin actually, Michael Linton, was cousin-in-law, was um, running Sony, and he gave me. Um, an unreleased photo of Rita Hayworth, and we put it in an Art Deco frame. Why? Because a couple years earlier, Sarkozy gave a speech to Congress, and he said that what he loves about America are Rita Hayworth, John Wayne, Marilyn Monroe, all the great American you know, movie stars of the 50s and 60s. And so when I got to the Elysee the, in, in, to get my credentials, he'd already received this gift, and he walked around grabbing credentials out of people's hands. He stops with me, and he goes, J'adore cette photo. C'est dans la résidence. J'adore cette photo. I love that picture. It's in my house. I love that picture. And to think about how every day the president of France wakes up and sees what he loves about America is, again, the power of our cultural diplomacy and assets. And a final quick story, really, uh, at the risk of boring your audience, is um, Sam Jackson. So um, Sam, Sam Jackson uh, came, uh, came to Paris. And, um, but, but before that, just two days earlier, I had been in what's called the banlieue. The banlieue um, uh, are uh, troubled uh, outskirts of Paris where there's a lot of crime and, and a lot of violence. And quite frankly, that's where the, the terrorist uh, strikes of late were, were, were hatched. And I went there because um, I wanted, I, I believe that it's important for people to understand who we are uh, as a nation and not just you know look at stereotypes. And so I went out there and I said, when they were complaining about France, I said, what do you like about America? And these kids in the banlieue said, we love Sam Jackson, we love Will I Am, we love Jodie Foster, Woody Allen, and uh, Will Smith. And by coincidence, Jackson comes two days later, and I brought him out to the banlieue, and uh, uh, even though they didn't think I, I would, um, and he gave him a tough love speech. And he said, you know what? Uh, the American dream and the French dream are the same. You just have to believe in yourself and fight for it. And he had been a two-dimensional movie star um, that wasn't even American. He was just a movie star. And when he spoke to those kids, he was an American. So it's it's amazing how Hollywood can be great, dip, you know, diplomatic uh, power of Hollywood and the cultural reach of the industry. I witnessed it firsthand. Anyway, many other stories like that, but but it was pretty powerful to see. So I have I have two other, um, if you will, stories about when you were ambassador, and then we'll shift to the movie industry and the sure, MPA. Sure. Um, one of them is I I believe you jumped out of an airplane over Normandy and parachuted down uh, on the uh, on the anniversary of D Day. And, didn't ask permission um, for that, by the way. <laughs> excuse me. I didn't ask permission before. Doing yeah, that. well, I was I was going to ask you. I, I it's my understanding, Charlie, from conversations we've had that you're actually afraid of heights, and so I was just a little curious how it was a guy who's afraid of heights who jumped out of an airplane because I've never done it before. Uh, well, uh, I, and I'll never do it again, really. But but uh, here's the story on that one. Um, there are 11 military cemeteries in France run by the ABMC, the American Battlefield and Monument Commission, that works for the embassy. And there are more Americans, military, buried in France than in any nation on earth except America. Uh, and we had a very strong contingent of, of defense attaches and uh, in representation in the embassy. So when my defense attache said that he wanted me to be the first ambassador to jump out of an airplane with the US Army's Golden Knights on the, at the time, 68th anniversary of D-Day, I said, yes. I said, yes, I was terrified to say yes, but I said yes, because I wanted to support our, our men in uniform, men and women in uniform, and it meant everything to him for me to do that because nobody else would be so stupid. So I I, I, um, I did it and we went to um, 14,000 feet. We jumped out with the Golden Knights. So the guys that jumped with uh, President you know, 41 Bush. Uh, I landed in front of, um, uh, I, I was told anyway, 25,000 people in the audience for the D-Day Memorial right at saint mary Glise, where our parachuters came down uh, the night before, 68 years earlier. I was flying and looking down at the same fields that they landed in. Of course, I wasn't being shot at, uh, but when I landed, I did a live interview in French on French television. So with hindsight, it was pretty risky because I could have, there was like a 20 mile an hour wind going on. I could have ended up in a tree. I could have hurt myself, would have been embarrassing, but it, it wasn't. And there was an, it was interesting because in the audience was the Secretary of the Navy, Ray Mabus, 
uh, and uh, and he had a challenge for me uh, uh, as well about uh, F-18s. <laughs> so I was just going to say, so on that, that's the other one I want to talk about because both you and I have been fortunate, you many more times than I, but I've done it once to fly out on a cod and land on an aircraft carrier, um, right. and which was really quite an experience. And getting launched off on the cod, it was something I will never, ever forget. But then you went up in an F-16 or an F-18? F-18 Super Hornet, the ones that are in Top Gun Maverick. And did yeah. you get launched off an aircraft carrier or did you just take off from so, an airbase? I'm the only civilian I know of that's done that because uh, I, I got very lucky because um, uh, they don't let civilians go in the F-18s off the carriers um, much. But Ray Mavis made it happen because he had seen the jump. So, uh, But you know what was really cool about it? And 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 I agree, Willie, landing on a car, the, the onboard delivery you know, uh, carrier uh, is pretty cool, but it's windowless. Right. It, experience. I mean, if you don't like heights, I, I don't really particularly like flying and to be in that thing with no windows was the scariest thing that's ever happened to me. Well, you know, what's fun about, about that is that these, these, what they call rep events as an ambassador is there are only at the time there were 11, 11 Nimitz class carriers. That's the largest nuclear aircraft carrier in the U S Navy at the time. Uh, and the only nuclear powered carriers in the world are America and France. And so we had 11 and the French had one, the Charles de Gaulle. And the Charles de Gaulle was about 50%, 40% as big as a, as a Nimitz class. So when I took French generals, French politicians, French leaders onto this floating city, this magnificent city, uh, the, the US uh, Navy is incredible. And uh, when you watched from the tower, as you saw, Willie, the ballet of the planes leaving and landing and coordinating, it was just unlike anything else. But what I did was I, 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 I went up there uh, and my pilot's name was Bob, I remember, because uh, uh, I'm sorry, it was Bert, because I remember it from Sesame Street, he was Bert. And I was in the back seat. I, the reason I said Bob is if you guys have seen Top Gun Maverick, in the movie, there's a guy named Bob who sits in the back seat. Uh, uh, that's, that's the seat I was in. But so I, I sit down, you have these compression pants on, and they say, Mr. Ambassador, whatever you do, don't touch this button, because that'll blow off the canopy. You don't want that to happen. Don't push this button because that will take all the fuel out of the plane. You won't make it back to the carrier. And whatever you do, don't push this button because that will be the ejector seat, and you'll pass out as, as you as you as you hit you know velocity. Uh, so, so you basically don't want to touch anything back there. But it takes off, and we went about you know six to eight G's. Uh, and uh, the, the captain Bob said, uh, "How you doing, Mister Ambassador?" And I go, "Let me ask you a question, Bert. I mean, to say, let me ask you a question, Bert. Uh, if you love flying so much, how come?" You know, how come you weren't in the Air Force? And uh, uh, Bert doesn't answer. And I'm thinking, damn, I hope that ejector seat button isn't in his you know, <laughs> canopy as well, or I'm in trouble. But there was silence. And all of a sudden, it, the plane just turns like this and goes straight up into the sky. And you realize that these aren't planes. These are controlled rockets, right? Yeah. And it does something called, for anybody who's an aviator in, in your audience, an Immelman loop. He does two backwards Immelman loops, and he lands upside down. Uh, we're uh, on the clouds. So you're basically, when you look at the canopy, you're looking at the clouds and then the earth, you're upside down, flips back to normal. And he says, Ambassador, did uh, did that answer your question? <laughs> I said, uh, well, well, Bert, it actually did not answer my question. And he goes, what I just did, what you just did, uh, would have been over land, would have been illegal uh, as we crossed 17 states. We would have been in violation of almost every airspace you, you can think of. He goes, ah. Well, out here over the ocean, we can do what we want. Mr. Ambassador, if you like to fly, you're a naval aviator. And I never forgot him saying that. And then when I watched Top Gun Maverick, I mean, those are real scenes. Those guys are in the cockpit, very little CG used. Uh, they wanted to have the reality of what the, the Gs on your face look like. And, uh, and it really shows the power of the American military. And our collaboration historically with the US military the industry has been very strong. You want that projection of what Top Gun Maverick looks like to the world being sent around the world. And that film is done about a billion three so far. Yeah, I want to I want to talk about that in a second, because I think it's uh, I want to I want to ask you whether you think that it may end up going down in history as sort of what has not saved the movie industry, but really revitalized, particularly the in theater part of the movie industry. But let, let's jump to the MPA. You're celebrating 100 years at the Motion Picture Association. Um, you said at the top, Charlie, that there are only six members of the Motion Picture Association. I was kind of scratching my head thinking about whether there's another industry association with so few members. And I'm pretty sure there isn't. I mean, well, well the, the recording industry, the RIAA has three. 
Oh, is that it? Okay, there you go. Okay, you're right. It's it's it's, it's amazing though the the influence that just a very few companies have, and I guess Netflix has just become a member. But when I read that and then saw the other members, I sort of said to myself, "Why isn't Amazon a member of the Motion Picture Association?" Well, first of all, it's that's a great observation. And uh, Netflix, one of the things I'm proud of, I, I've been at the MPA almost five years now. And one of the first things that I did was I brought Netflix on board. I mentioned earlier that I had been running the Obama Southern California elite campaign with Nicole Avon, um, incredible uh, person who's also married to Ted Sarandos, the CEO of Netflix. And so I've known them for a while. And uh, Netflix made a lot of sense because they were making extraordinary um, uh, movies and television shows. And, and the MPA is film, TV, and streaming. It's not just film, it's film, TV, and streaming. And so um, when uh, you know Ted uh, was bold and, and agreed to join, uh, MP, uh, Netflix has been a real core member of the MPA ever since. But you ask about Amazon and Apple, and you know Netflix is a pure play content creator, right? So Apple and Amazon are multi-trillion dollar companies who have other businesses, uh, much bigger businesses than just creation of content. But I would say that if you're going to spend the kind of money that Apple TV Plus and Amazon Prime are spending making incredible programming, I don't see why they wouldn't want to be part of the Motion Picture Association. Apple won the Academy Award for CODA last year, as you guys saw. So the first streaming company winning an Academy Award. So I don't see why they wouldn't want to be it, but I don't have anything to announce today. And uh, I just think in time, if you're going to be making an Academy Award winning product and spending tens of billions of dollars on content, you want to be part of the group that's leading the industry and making decisions on behalf of the industry. So more to come. We'll see what happens there. So you talked, Charlie, about streaming and how important Netflix is to it. The Motion Picture Association actually put out a research report last year talking about, if you will, the breadth of your industry, because there's a lot of talk about the fact that, for instance, the gaming industry, if you look at just in theater sales and record sales, that the gaming industry is bigger than movies and, and, and music together. And yet the MPA is very straightforward in, in, in pointing out that if you take um, physical theaters, digital streaming, theatrical and pay television, you put all those together and it's a $328 billion a year industry. And then you add on top of that free television and all the advertising around it. And it's actually a half a trillion dollar industry on an annual basis. I thought it was so interesting. And I guess the question, and it's sort of a little bit back to Apple and Amazon is it used to be the big five studios before you brought Netflix in. And now all of a sudden you have just so many different content providers, creators, and kind of new media is something that's very difficult for people to get their arms around. Um, how do you, given that most people think about the MPA as I go to see Maverick, how do you manage all the breadth of the touch points that your constituents have and then all of the changing channels at which they're touching consumers? Oh, this makes the job fun, really, honestly. And, uh, uh, you know, I mentioned that we are film, TV, and streaming. People think of us as the Motion Picture Association of America, but we're Motion Picture Association really is meant to cover film, TV, and streaming for, for the world. America is only 5% of the world's population. Our product sells to all, you know, every, every country abroad, and, and that's what drives our economics. Uh, but you're right. It, the, the ground is shifting underneath us. Your, your statistics are spot on target, and not everybody knows those numbers that you just quoted a, a, a second ago. Um, and uh, and yet, where is it all headed? You know, is streaming going to be the dominant force or theater is going to be the dominant force? And also how to involve the technology companies like Apple and Amazon that you mentioned. Uh, so let me ask you, answer your question slightly in, in an, uh, a, a kind of a, a different way. We have brought in Apple TV Plus and Amazon Prime into our coalition against piracy uh, called ACE, uh, the Alliance for Creativity and Entertainment that has about 40 members. It's the Motion Picture Association 6, plus Apple and Amazon, plus companies like the BBC and, and uh, Canal Plus in France and other, others around the world. We, we created it from scratch. And it's the single greatest piracy, anti-piracy force that's ever been established. And we're in partnership with Apple and Amazon. I mentioned ACE and can happy to talk about that later if you want. I mentioned it because the key to managing all these diverse interests is finding commonality, finding things that we can all agree on which by the way, is the essence of diplomacy at the end of the day. And so um, one thing we can agree on is that we um, don't want our stuff stolen by illegal pirates. And piracy, by the way, these aren't just the guys on the street corner selling DVDs. These are criminal enterprises. Pi pirates are uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, mobs, they're, they're uh, organized prostitution, crime, 
uh, sex trafficking. This is the kind of people that are stealing movies right now. So we put a global coalition together to fight it. We're doing, we're doing really well. Um, but other issues are market access. That's why we get involved with trade deals, um, copyright protection, IP protection. So we can find even where we disagree, there's always areas where we do agree. And Will, you mentioned video games, and we both uh, have a, a good friend who, who runs a large video game company uh, and follow the industry closely. I talked to the head of the Industry um, uh, Association for Video Games, ECA, I named Stan Pierre-Louis quite frequently, and there are overlapping interests already with video games. A lot of our member studios have video game companies inside their tents. Others are going to be buying video game companies. And so the walls are blurring right now. The lines are blurring. Entertainment as a force won't be as distinct as it used to be. It'll be, you know, and we're keeping our eye open on that and partnering with the video game industry, partnering with sports teams, which are entertainment uh, for other things. So anyway, the long-winded answer to your question, Willie, is it's complex because there are regulations for all these things that differ throughout Europe and Asia and around the world. Uh, and our member studios don't always agree with priorities because they have different economic interests. But that's what makes the job fun. Yeah, Charlie, on that, as it relates to trade policy, I was very interested to hear you point out the fact that the replacement to NAFTA Back when NAFTA was put together during the Clinton administration, intellectual property and piracy were not big issues. And so it wasn't a part of the original NAFTA free trade agreement, whereas the new replacement has significant guardrails, if you will, as it relates to intellectual property. And I just thought it was so interesting that some of these trade deals have actually gotten antiquated as it relates to protecting sort of, you know, one of the, if not the most important export from the United States today, which is intellectual property through software, through media, through everything else that we're producing. Well, Willie, as you, as you mentioned early on in our conversation, I, I used to be the Assistant Secretary of State for Economic and Business Affairs, and in my portfolio was, was trade, uh, as well as intellectual property protection. So um, as far as trade goes, we did the Transatlantic uh, a, a, a Partnership, TTIP, uh, and we also did um, you know, the, um, M, the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. When I say we did, we tried to advance these deals, neither of them right. got passed. But when you think about it, NAFTA was so outdated that the idea of TPP made a ton of sense because you're uniting the two fastest growing regions on earth, the Asia Pacific and America, and the North American contingent were America, Canada, and Mexico. What a coincidence, uh, USMCA is Canada, America, and Mexico. And uh, in spite of all the political rhetoric, the deal, the USMCA deal is very, very similar to what would have been signed on TPP just with three nations as opposed to 12. And what's fascinating about it is that it does help us protect copyright. What it does is it strengthens copyright protection, USMCA does in a major way. Uh, it also um, helps with online enforcement. With uh, it, it helps us make sure that people aren't stealing it and that, and that our, our properties are, are safe. And it helps with market access, getting access to certain areas of the Mexican and Canadian markets that, that we didn't have before. So um, uh, it's a, you know we're very supportive of USMCA. We're very supportive of trade deals in general. On a personal level, I wish that we would use USMCA as a way to get back into the TPP 11, uh, which has now changed and unfortunately weakened in, in, since we left. But it would be amazing if we could unite um, the world with that. That's just my personal opinion. I know that a lot of industries, including mine, would benefit from that. So it feels a little bit like movies are back. Uh, it's been a great summer. Sales are, I believe, 2x what they were last summer in the summer of 21 of over 3 billion just during the summer months. Um, but that's still 600 million below the run rate in 18 and 19, I believe, Charlie. What's your sense as it relates to sort of the, the domestic theater market being back and people actually going back to the big screen? Well, Willie, we think about that all the time. And uh, uh, I, would, I would tell you, there's a guy that runs the, um, the my new NATO, the National Association of Theater Runners, as opposed to the NATO that I dealt with. Oh. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's quite a shift there. I, I was going to say, that's, that's a little change in lexicon, but nonetheless, just as important, I'm sure. Just as important. And this guy, John Fithian, excellent person we talk all the time, he'll tell you, because he lives the, you know, the exhibition business 24-7, uh, uh, that when you look at movies, I mentioned Top Gun, done about a billion four right now. Uh, Doctor Strange, about 950 million. Jurassic World, 975 million. Uh, Minions, 800 million. Uh, Love and Thunder, 720 million. Not only are these things back in a major way, but it's not just the action hero movies that I would mention. There's also films like, I don't know if you've seen Everything Everywhere All at Once, but this is what they call a platform release, meaning it started very small 
and grew with word of mouth, that's made over $100 million. So you have kids' films like Minions, platform films. You have uh, Elvis, but I think globally about um, um, uh, you know, 250, 260 million, but it's a fantastic movie. And, uh, uh, and what you're seeing is, is that it's very healthy. What's more, movie going begets movie going. And for, for people in the audience, when you go to a film and you see uh, all the trailers, you're like, I wanna come back and see that movie. Uh, and, and we didn't have that during the pandemic, right? Because people weren't going to theaters, so they couldn't, they couldn't get excited about the next one. Uh, and your point about not being quite at the levels of pre-pandemic, well, I'm not sure our nation as a whole is at the level of pre-pandemic. Uh, you know, it, it, I keep an eye on the space because the theatrical space remains very, very vibrant. People want to get out of their help, house. They want to experience what you can see in a big theater. You know, uh, it's been proven that if you want to see a horror film, it's scarier when people to your left and right or, or that you don't know are screaming at the movie because they're terrified or a comedy where people you don't know are laughing their heads off. Um, there's a communal aspect to going to the movies that won't be replaced. And it isn't being cannibalized by streaming, which I know is part of your question, uh, because our theme report that you quoted to me, it shows that we went from uh, 1.2 billion to 1.3 billion streamers, so it increased 14%. Um, in, in spite of all the news about, you know, the competition, Netflix at one point, um, you know, reported a loss of drivers of a couple hundred thousand, but the overall streaming market is growing at the same time the theater market is growing. And our statistics show that the more technologically sophisticated you are, the more electronic devices you have, the more likely you're going to go on and go to the movies in addition to watching it at home. But I will say really one final thing, which is, again, for film, TV and streaming, uh, the, the theatrical market took a hit during the pandemic. We all know that. But, um, but the streaming market went crazy during the pandemic. Right. And so the large American studios did very well. And thank goodness, because of our incredible safety protocols, we were able to make movies and television shows that entertain people during a very difficult time in their lives. So um, a quick plug for my friend, Jamie Lee Curtis, who was on the webcast two weeks ago. She has Halloween coming out this fall. So to Charlie's point about go watch it in the theater with somebody next to you screaming, I will not be going to see it because I don't really like scary movies. Um, but I also actually last weekend saw the saw the finale to it. Uh, Jamie showed it to me on her phone and swore me to secrecy about what ends up happening at the end of the film. Uh, but it's worth watching. Um, so Charlie, one of the one of the things that surprised me in doing some research was that the number of theaters in the United States, I would have thought had shrunk dramatically since pre-pandemic levels. Um, and the, the, the number of theaters is gone from 41,200 down to 40,700. So there've only been 500 screens closed during the pandemic. I was A, shocked by that. And I guess a little bit maybe because AMC was like one of these meme stocks that everyone sort of said, you know, there's nothing there other than meme investors. And I kind of sat there and said, AMC's up 68% in the month of August alone. Is that due to Maverick or is that due to actually, you know, um, people just playing on this meme theme? And it seems to be it's on Maverick. It's that people are actually going back to the theaters and that ticket sales are up. And Maverick was one of those movies that was meant to be seen on the big screen. And, and, if, and if you're going to see Maverick, people in the audience that haven't seen it yet, go see it on an IMAX you know, screen with full sound. It's just incredible. There are those experiences are really not available to anything. You know, less than one percent of Americans could have that kind of uh, theaters at home. Uh, Will, your point about the, about the movie theater decrease, um, th that is thanks to a lot of things, including the U.S. government stepping in to help theaters. Uh, you know, with a number of different acts that, that really made sure to protect it because the film, TV and streaming industry, you know, has two, supports around two and a half million. This is including the exhibition business, uh, Americans of all walks of life. And these, are, um, these aren't the stars that walk the carpets, right? Th these are electricians and plumbers and makeup artists and hairdressers. They're blue collar workers. Our business is one of the most unionized industries in the world, in America, I mean to say. And, uh, and these guys were at risk of losing their jobs and their livelihood. And the American government stepped in to keep it alive and that helped with the theater owners uh, as well. Uh, and now that we have movies back again, um, that's gonna really pay off for them. So you're right in pointing it out, but I think, thank goodness, we didn't have all these theaters closed during the pandemic. That would have been an absolute tragedy for, uh, for a lot of workers, but also for America. I've heard you talk about when a film crew goes to a city to film in the United States, that that injects about $250,000 a day into the local economy. And you just talked about um, everyone from riggers to painters to all the people who actually support the movie industry. And you, I, I believe that all six best picture 
films this past year in the Academy Award were all made in the United States. Is that a is that a structural shift, Charlie, or is that a pandemic shift where all that production came back to the U.S. in 2020 and 2021, which made those films that were up this year, but that the film industry will go back to making films in foreign markets just because of the price competitiveness? It's a complex question, and so let me let me uh, answer it this way. Uh, starting with why so many movies were made here, it's because we put together the um, the industry uh, and with all the uh, various unions and guilds put together a set of safety protocols that literally were second to none. And to give you a sense for that, uh, on set uh, contagion uh, positivity rates for our industry were 0.5 percent compared to 8.6 percent in another you know in industry in America at large. We have we have an amazing system of different rings of safety that allow these movies to get made. The movies that you're seeing today were made during the pandemic. A lot of them were right. somewhere off, and I think we did that better um, than a lot of other nations in the world. So it made a lot of sense to to, to make the movies here. But the second part of your question is um, we are a very portable industry. It's very fluid. We can make our movies anywhere, and we're going to make our movies on our television shows and streaming properties. Uh, in in places that offer us proper incentives to 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 film or, or shoot there, uh, and also places that have the facilities, places that have the talent, uh, and uh, and so um, I don't believe that it's to answer your question directly that it's a that it's because that so many movies were made during the pandemic in America that's the way the future is going to be. We're going to be going wherever in the world it makes sense to make the movies. Sometimes a uh, television show needs to be set in a foreign country because of its content, you know, et cetera. So I think uh, you're going to see more productions made in America, but also more productions made, made around the world. Just talking about foreign markets, China is the second largest film market in the world. And I'm just curious, are we exporting U.S. films to China, Charlie, or are studios out making films that are specifically for the Chinese market that we never see? Uh, it's, a, it's a great question, Willie. China um, is an interesting market. It, it, it has over 80,000 screens in movie theaters. In America, by contrast, that's just north of 40,000 screens. Uh, but, uh, but they're trying to fill those screens as much, as much as they can with domestic product. There's a film called Wolf Warrior II, for example, it's out a few years ago, that uh, did over a billion dollars inside China alone. You won't find very many films, if ever, that are going to do a billion inside America alone, because their domestic audience is, is enormous. Um, but the other thing about the Chinese film industry is that it reports into the propaganda ministry of the Chinese Communist Party. And so as a result, in my opinion, their films are not as exportable as ours because the jingoistic movie about Wolf Warrior is really playing just to the Chinese domestic audience and no one wants to see it. The difference is that if they wanted, if people wanted to see it, they could here in America because we don't block people's films from coming in. So the trouble, the problem we've been having with China is uh, then Vice President Biden and then Vice Premier Xi um, did a deal back in 2012 that was a WTO resolution of a dispute that allowed our movies to get into the Chinese market where they were being stopped from entering. And we had a, a floor of 34 films is what was talked about. But the film was meant, to, this deal was meant to have been completed in 2017, five years later, and it never did because of the geopolitical problems between America and China. And as a result, you know, you put us any market in the world, we, if, if, if we're on a level playing field, our film television streaming industry is going to win. But in China, we get paid 25% of the of theatrical versus 50 to 60 everywhere else in the world. Uh, movies are stacked up against each other. We aren't given any time for marketing, if all, if any at all. Uh, it's not fair. And those that, that MOU needs to be completed. And we're hopeful that the government will be able to, uh, uh, to do that. But the other problem is censorship. And... Um, you know, an interesting example is um, when one of our studios, well, in this case, Disney, when it sold um, Black Panther uh, into the GCC, the, the Gulf states, I think that they had to insert, you know, digital um, clothing on shoulders because of cultural sensitivities. There are small edits and changes that are made to films as we send them around the world for cultural sensitivity reasons. But uh, in China, uh, they, you know, um, I'm, I don't know if you saw Spider-Man No Way Home, but Spider-Man did a billion nine worldwide, huge, without China. Wow. And so how does a film, they could have, they probably left three, four hundred million dollars on the table by not being in China. Why weren't they in China? Well, according to Forbes magazine, I'm just quoting what they said, uh, the, um, uh, the Chinese said that effectively, if you want to show this movie in China, 
um, then um, you need to get rid of all the scenes of the Statue of Liberty. Uh, for those of you who've seen Spider-Man No Way Home, the entire third act is on top of the Statue of Liberty. Uh, and uh, so then they reduced it to the scenes where the American superheroes are looking heroic need to be eliminated. And somebody said no. So, you know, we don't listen to those to those changes. I know there's a lot of stuff in the press saying that we kowtow to China, which we really don't. You know, an industry doesn't think, uh, you know, as a monolith, each company makes their own decisions. But there's plenty of examples of that. So the Chinese market is complicated. We think that it, we don't have the access we deserve. We're not getting paid what we think we should get paid. And of course, there's the matter, matter of editing. Um, so. Um, uh, we're hopeful. We're working with the Secretary of Commerce, we're working with USDR, we're working with the U.S. government. We're hopeful to get that negotiation back on track, and we're hopeful to resolve the issue with China. Um, uh, you know, in, in, a, in a, I hope in the year to come. It's interesting that you bring up the point about the Statue of Liberty, because when you were U.S. Ambassador to France, you would often remind people that the Statue of Liberty is a gift from the French government to the United States of America. Many people think that we put it out there, but they actually gave it to us. So maybe the French took more offense to Spider-Man not being able to be shown in China than the United States did. Um, Charlie, as you think about sort of, if you will, Hollywood, there's, you know, Hollywood has this history of the big studios and the big names and, you know, stars, what have you, given the changing landscape, and I know, I think you're going to challenge you on this one. Who's the most important person in Hollywood today? Is it a CEO of one of the big studios? Is it an actor like Tom Cruise? Or is it the big media companies that are starting to dip their toe into new media and using their global reach to be able to change what the entertainment industry is doing? I don't think actually, Willie, that there's an answer to that question. And of course, if I did give the answer, I'd be in a lot of trouble. But I don't right, think I realize that. <laughs> but I, I think you know where I'm going. I want directionally. Like, it, I mean, do the stars still have the power that they used to have? I mean, Tom Cruise took a revenue share on this movie. I mean, my understanding was when they projected it to be three to four hundred million dollars a box office, that Tom was going to make close to a hundred million dollars. So the fact that it's gone to a billion three or a billion four, Tom Cruise is making a ton of money off this film. You know, um, you know, backing up from the stars for a second. My, uh, there's only been six uh, chairman and CEOs of the Motion Picture Association in 100 years. And the most famous one was Jack Valenny. Right. And Valenny um, uh, did the job for 40 years. In fact, he has on his tombstone in Arlington Cemetery, the MPA logo on his tombstone. And that, that's who he was. But you know, his son, John, and I went to St. Albans together. I've known John, I've known Jack and his, and, and, um, his family forever. But anyway, go ahead. Sorry to interrupt. And then you know that Jack was extraordinary. He was larger than life. And he pioneered a number of things, including speaking at the Oscars and introducing movies to a billion people and raising the profile of the MPA. I met him as well several times. I have a letter from him hanging on my, my wall at, at work. And I have a, we have a whole room at the MPA devoted to Valenti because of his outsized role. But Valenti, I have uh, six studios and 18 board members. Valenti um, really only had to call one guy, Lou Wasserman. Because it was at a time when Hollywood was run by one guy, uh, and uh, and everyone acknowledged it. When Lou got involved, everything fell into place. So in some ways, his job was not that Jack would have been amazing in today's world as well, but he had a different landscape, and his landscape was really not film, TV, and streaming. It was just the movies. So right. it was a different animal. Uh, but there isn't that Wasserman guy anymore. There's not one guy that, that, that's controlling Hollywood, and um, and yet the, all the elements matter. The powerful agencies matter. Uh, the, the CEOs and dynamic leaders of my six studios matter tremendously. Uh, and, the, and of course, the writers, the producers, directors, the creative community, all of them matter. But stars still matter, too. And on your point about Tom Cruise, I was in Cannes and uh, I saw the premiere of uh, Top Gun Maverick in Cannes. And now, look, I spent a lot of time in France, as you know, and sometimes that Cannes audience can be a little bit jaded. Uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, films there that are more art films than commercial films. The French uh, believe that that's what film should be in some ways. Um, and nonetheless, I counted six separate times when that crowd broke into spontaneous applause uh, during that film. And Tom Cruise is in the audience, and he went to the stage afterwards to receive an award from the head of Cannes, and uh, the entire place stopped. You could just you could see the power of his celebrity on display, uh, unforgettably so. Um, so uh, uh, you know the answer is that uh, it all matters. It's the entire creative community, big and small. A lot of Netflix, I mean, look at Squid Game, right? If Netflix has, with the trades reporter, a billion dollar franchise in a, in a series that was made in Korea, filmed in Korean, using Korean actors that nobody's ever heard of. Uh, you know, so you don't need a star 
to, to generate that kind of asset. On the other hand, um, you know, you, the Top Gun is, is a counterweight to that. It's the entire un, unique and, and uh, extraordinary creative community that our, our nation has, and, and many of it is in Hollywood. I think it's really interesting, Charlie, as you talk about the the breadth uh, of, of not just what movies can do for the movie industry, the entertainment industry, but more broadly, I think about F1 and what the Netflix Drive to Survive series has done for the value of the F1 franchise, which Liberty Media owns. And I think they bought it for $4 billion and lots of talk about it being worth at least double that today, if not more. And how much of that value accretion to owning the, you know, the F1 uh, franchise has come from the Netflix series and the halo effect of opening up F1 to the U.S. audience in a way that never ABC or NBC or CBS was able to do in the past. And it's just amazing how entertainment has transformed the actual industry underlying a sport. Hey, uh, Netflix helped the chess market with Queen's Gambit too. Yeah, right. Exactly. Right. I hadn't even thought about that. Right. Not, not quite to the degree of F1, I'm sure. Right, actually, you're right, and but it's a perfect example. It, it's uh, you capture, you know, storytelling is as old as humankind, and if you tell the right stories, then you're going to capture the imagination, and it has enormous impact. Um, that's why our industry is so special. But yes, you're exactly right. F one's a great example. So I want to close on your leadership, and just a question, Charlie, as it relates to having gone from business to foreign policy, politics to now running the Motion Picture Association, all very different roles, and yet you have applied your leadership to be very successful in all of them. Um, I met with Jim Collins up in Boulder probably three or four years ago, and Jim and I were talking about how difficult it is for leaders to, if you will, transcend industries, to move from business to politics or from politics to business or vice versa. You've been able to do it through all three. What's been the trick from a leadership standpoint? I'm a big fan of Collins and Porras and their work, and that must have been a fun conversation you had with them. It was. Uh, love to meet him one day. The um, uh, it's great. It's a great question, Willie. Uh, everybody approaches leadership differently. In in my case, if I were trying to think about uh, commonality, um, I I ran um, media companies that involved in many cases um, healthy egos, and I'm currently running a, a, an association filled with. Um, uh, you know, the biggest companies uh, in media in the world, and that comes with um, strong-willed uh, board members. Uh, and uh, and I was in an ambassador where I was dealing with the head of state like Sarkozy, and I described it. And I think the common element is diplomacy, believe it or not. I really do believe this to be true, because diplomacy at its core is about finding common ground. And I mentioned it earlier in our, in our conversation um, with um, the issues that matter to everybody and finding a way to get to that to that place. But I learned different things from different people. Jim Henson, who was extraordinary, I learned something at him that I never forgot. I was just out of business school, Willie. All of our, you know, you went there as well. That you know, they were going to banking and consulting. I, I joined a little puppet company, and 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 I was working in the basement of the building because I was so taken by Jim. Uh, and anyway, I'm working late at night on spreadsheets, and no one was around. Uh, and I saw this figure walk past the, the, my desk, and I didn't see who it was. It was in the dark. And the next night, it happened again. And so I, I followed this shadowy figure and I saw that he went into the boiler room uh, and then uh, and then, you know, I didn't want to pry, so I, I went home. But the next day I, I went into that boiler room, opened the door, and it was fascinating because the boiler room, the pipes in the boiler room all had Muppet googly eyes and they looked like puppets. And it was, you know, he, he kind of decorated the room. But in there was Matthew Karen's the janitor. And I said, Matthew, I swear I, I saw someone come in here. He goes, oh, that was Jim Henson. I said, so Jim comes to the boiler room to say hi to you? He goes, no, he came by to bounce ideas off me. And uh, I said, oh, well, Jim Henson bounces ideas off me. That's great to know. So I, I, I go up, you know, the next day I was in Jim's office and I had a little bit of a smirk on my face inappropriately. And I said, I hear that you're, that Matthew Karens is a, is a source of your ideas and you're bouncing ideas off him. And he looked really hurt. And he kind of sounded like Kermit, you know, so he goes, well, Charlie, you know, uh, uh, good ideas can come from anywhere. And, and he's right, good ideas can come from anywhere. And just because somebody has a high title that says that they're the senior executive of Muckety Muck doesn't mean that they have the best ideas. It's always important in my mind to reach below into the organization to get an understanding of the guts of an organization and to stand behind your people, to always stand behind uh, your people and to lead by example. But I've done that with, with Jim and, and uh, you know, for people to know the buck stops here, for people to know that you're fighting for them, the way that I was uh, trying to help our defense attache 
through foolishly risking my life is an extreme example. But the point is, I tell you, that military was pretty happy with everything I did from that moment forward. Uh, I think it's leading by example. I think it's finding common ground. I, I think it's, um, at the end of the day, it's about character. And uh, um, and I think that, that all three of those jobs, and I'm very lucky, Willie. I, I started off in the entertainment industry. I then went into diplomacy. And then I found the only job that I can think of on earth that marries those two worlds. Right. So in some ways, it all comes together at the Motion Picture Association. And that's what makes it, uh, that's what makes it easy to lead, I think. Well, um, given your public service and your dedication of your time and efforts to that, thank you um, very much, because our country benefited greatly from that time and service that you gave to us. Um, and thank you for taking the time to spend an hour with me and talk about all that you've done and all that you are doing today with the Motion Picture Association. It's uh, it's just great to see you, and I'm deeply appreciative of you spending the time with me. Um, to everyone who tuned in today, thank you so much. Um, I'm back next week with uh, Gonzaga basketball coach Mark Few uh, to talk about how Mark has taken a what used to be a mid-major university basketball program and turned it into arguably the best basketball program in the United States um, in uh, in tiny Spokane, Washington. Um, and so it's a, it'll be a great conversation next week with Mark. Charlie, thank you again and enjoy your time up in Sun Valley. Um, my best to your family and we'll talk soon. Willie, thanks so much. An honor to be here. Really appreciate it. Take care.